and according to Scotland Yard, the crime took place at 24 Culver Street, Paddington. The murdered woman was a Mrs. Maureen Lyon. In connection with the murder, the police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and a soft felt hat. Motorists are warned against icebound roads. The heavy snow is expected to continue, and throughout the country there will be a certain freezing, particularly at points on the north and northeast coast of Scotland. Mrs. Barlow? Mrs. Barlow? Molly! Molly? Molly, where are you? Doing all the work, you brew. Oh, there you are. Uh, leave it all to me. Shall I stoke the agar? Done. Oh. Hello, sweetheart. Your nose is cold. Oh, I've just come in. Why? Where have you been? Surely you haven't been out in this weather. I had to go down to the village for some stuff I'd forgotten. Did you get the chicken, Eddie? No, it wasn't the right kind. I went to another dump, but that wasn't any good either. Practically a whole day wasted. Oof. My God, I'm half frozen. The car was skidding like anything. And the snow's coming down thick. What do you bet we're snowed up tomorrow? Oh, dear. I do hope not. If only the pipes don't freeze. Yes, we'll have to keep the central heating well stoked up. Ooh, not too good. I wish they'd send the coke along. We've not got any too much. Oh, I do so want everything to go well at first. First impressions are so important. Is everything ready? Nobody's arrived yet, I suppose. No, thank goodness. I think everything's in order. <coughs> Mrs. Barlow hooked it early. Afraid of the weather, I suppose. Oh, what a nuisance these daily women are. That, that leaves everything on your shoulders. And yours. This is a partnership. Oh, as long as you don't ask me to cook. No, no, that's my department. Anyway, we've got lots and tins in case we are snowed up. Oh, Giles, do you think it's going to be all right? Oh, got cold feet, have you? Are you sorry now we didn't sell this place and your aunt left it to you instead of having this, you know, this mad idea of running is at a guest house? No, I'm not. I love it. And talking of a guest house, just look at that. Oh, pretty good, what? It's a disaster. Don't you see? You left out the S. Monkwell instead of Monkswell. Good Lord, so I did. However did I come to do that? But it doesn't really matter, does it? Monkwell is just as good a name. You're in disgrace. Go stoke up the central heating. Oh, across the icy yard. Uh, shall I soak it up for the night now? No, you don't do that till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. How appalling. Hurry up, so we may arrive at any minute now. Uh, you've got all the rooms worked out? Yes. Mrs. Boyle, front four poster room. Major Metcalf, blue room. Miss Casewell, east room. Mr. Wren, oak room. I wonder what all these people will be like. Oughtn't we have got rent in advance? Uh, we're rather mugs at this game. They bring their luggage. If they don't pay, we hang on to the luggage. It's quite simple. I can't help thinking we ought to have taken our correspondence course in hotel keeping. We're sure to get had in some way. Their luggage might just be bricks wrapped up in newspaper. And where should we be then? They all wrote from very good addresses. Mm, and that's what servants with forged references do. Some of these people may be, well, criminals hiding from the police. I don't care what they are, so as long as they pay us seven guineas every week. Oh, you're such a wonderful woman of business, Molly. And according to Scotland Yard, the crime took place at 24 Culver Street, Paddington. The murdered woman was a Mrs. Maureen Lyon. In connection with the murder, the police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and a soft felt hat. Motorists are warned against icebound roads. The heavy snow is expected to continue, and throughout the country there will be a certain freezing, particularly at points on the north and northeast coast of Scotland. In How do you do? Thanks so much. Weather is simply awful. My Cassie give it to your gate. What an attempt to drive. No sporting instinct. Are you Mrs. Ralston? Oh, how delightful. My name's Wren. How do you do, Mr. Wren? You know, you're not at all so I picture you. I've been thinking of you as retired general's widow, Indian Army. I picture you being truthfully grim and unsinhibitious. The whole place would be simply crammed with Benali's brass. Instead, oh, it's heavenly, quite heavenly, lovely proportions. Oh, oh, that's a fake. This table is genuine. Oh, I'm simply going to love this place. 
Have you got any wax flowers or birds of paradise? I'm afraid not. Oh, what a pity. What about a cyborg? A purple plummy mahogany cyborg with great salt card boots on it? Yes, we have in the dining room. In here? Oh, I must see it. <laughs> Do come and warm yourself. Well, absolutely perfect. Real bedrock of respectability. But why do away with the center of a mahogany table? Little tables just spoil the effect. We thought our guests would prefer them. <laughs> this is my husband. <gasps> How do you do? It's a wonder, isn't it? Takes one back to Diggits and Scrooge and that irritating Tiny Tim. So bogus. Actually, <laughs> Mrs. Ralston, you were absolutely right about the little tables. <laughs> I was being carried away by my feeling for period. <laughs> if you had a mahogany dining table, you'd have had right family around it. Stern, handsome father with a beard, prolific, faded mother, eleven children of assaulted ages, a grim governess, and somebody called poor Harriet. The poor relation who has his dread old dog's body and is very, very grateful for being in a good home. <laughs> I'll take your suitcase upstairs for you. Oak room, did you say? Yes. I do hope it's got a four poster with little tits roses. It hasn't. I don't think your husband's going to like me. How have you two been married? Are you very much in love? Oh, we've been married just here. Perhaps you'd like to go up and see your room. Oh, ticked off. But you just like knowing all about people. I mean, I think people are so madly interesting, don't you? Well, I suppose some are, and some are not. No, I don't agree at all. I think they're all interesting. Because you never really know what anyone is really like, or what they're really thinking. For instance, you know you don't know what I'm thinking about right now, do you? <laughs> uh, not in the least. Cigarette? Oh no, thank you. <gasps> you see, the only people who really know what other people are like are artists, and they don't know why they know it. <laughs> but they're portrait painters. It comes out on the canvas. Are you a painter? No, I'm an architect. My parents, you know, baptized me Christopher in the hopes that I would be an architect. Christopher Red! <laughs> it's good, it's halfway home. Actually, of course, everyone always laughs about it, makes jokes about St. Paul's. However, who knows? I yet had the last laugh. <laughs> Chris Wren's people have nests, but yet to go down in history. I'm going to like it here. I find your wife most sympathetic. <laughs> Indeed. And really very beautiful. Oh, don't be absurd. <laughs> There now, isn't that like an English woman? Compliments always embarrass him. European women take compliments as a matter of course. The English women have all of the feminine spirit brushed out of them by their husbands. There's something very boorish about English husbands. Do come up and see your room. Oh, shall I? Can you suck up the hot water broiler? <laughs> I'm Giles Ross. Uh, come into the fire, Mrs. Boyle, and get warm. Awful weather, isn't it? Uh, is this your only luggage? A major Metcalf visit is seen to you. I'll leave the door for him. The taxi, when it risks coming up the drive, it stopped at the gate. We had to share a taxi from the station, and there was great difficulty in getting that. Nothing ordered to meet us, it seems. I'm so sorry. We didn't know what train you'd be coming by, you see. Otherwise, of course, we'd have seen this oh, one was... A... trains should have been next. Let me take your coat. My wife will be down in a minute. I'll just go give Metcalf a hand with the bags. The drive might have at least been cleared of snow. Most offhand and casual, I must say. I'm so sorry, I... Mrs. Ralston? Yes, I... You're very young. Young? To be running an establishment of this kind. You can't have that much experience. There has to be beginning for everything, hasn't there? I see. Quite experienced. An old house. I hope you haven't got your eye rot. Certainly not. A lot of people don't know they've got dry rot, so it's too late to do anything about it. This house is in perfect <clears throat> condition. Hmm. It could do with a coat of paint. You know, you've got worm in this soak. This way, Major. Uh, this is my wife. Oh. How do you do? Absolute blizzard outside. Thought one time we shouldn't make it. Oh, I beg your pardon. If it goes on like this, I should say you'll have five or six feet of snow by morning. 
not seen anything like it since I was on leave in 1940. Uh, we'll take these up. Which rooms did you say? Uh, blue room and rose room? No, I put Mr. Wren in the rose room. He liked the four poster so much. So it's Mrs. Boyle in the oak room and Major Metcalf in the blue room. Major! Sir? Do you have much servant difficulty here? We have quite a good local woman who comes in from the village. And what indoor staff? No indoor staff, just us. Indeed, I understood this was a guest house in full running order. We're only just starting. I would have said that a proper staff of servants was essential for opening an establishment of this kind. I consider your advertisement was most misleading. May I ask if I'm the only guest here with Major Metcalf, that is? Oh no, there are several here. And this weather too, a blizzard, no less. All very unfortunate. But we couldn't very well foresee the weather. Oh, the north wind doth blow, and it will bring snow. And what will the robin do then, poor thing? I adore nursery rhymes, don't you? Always so tragic and macabre. That's why children like them. <laughs> May I introduce Mr. Wren and Mrs. Boyle? Oh! <laughs> Why are you... But this is a very beautiful house, don't you think so? Don't you think so? I've come to the time of life when the amenities of an establishment are more important than its appearance. <sighs> if I did not believe this to be a running concern, I should never have come here. I understood it was fully equipped with every hill comfort. There is no obligation for you to remain here if you are not satisfied, Mrs. Boyle. No, indeed. I should not be doing so. If there has been any misapprehension, it would perhaps be better if you went elsewhere. I could ring up for the taxi to return. The roads are not yet blocked. We've had so many applications for rooms that we will be able to fill your place quite easily. In any case, we are raising our terms next month. Well, I'm certainly not going to be before I've tried with this place is live. You need to think you can turn me out now. Perhaps you might show me to my bedroom, Mrs. Ralston. Certainly, Mrs. Boyle. Darling, you are wonderful. Well, I think that's a perfectly horrible woman. I don't like her at all. I like to see you throw her out into the snow. Serve her right. Yes, well, it's a pleasure I've got to forego, I'm afraid. Oh. Lord, there's another of them. Uh, come in, come in. Walked about half a mile down the road. I'll run into a drift. Uh, let me take this. Any more stuff in the car? No, I travel light. Oh, glad to see you've got a good fire going. Uh, Mr. Wren, Miss. <laughs> Case, well. oh. uh, my wife will be down in a minute. Oh, no hurry. Got to get myself pulled out. Seems as though you're going to get snowed up here. Weather forecast says heavy falls expected, no respond, etc. Oh, yes. My wife's an, an excellent manager. And anyways, we can always eat our hands. Before we start eating each other. Eh? Eh? Oh, any news in the paper apart from the weather? Uh, usual political crisis. Oh, yes. And a rather juicy murder. Murder? Oh, I like murder. They seem to think it was a homicidal maniac. A strangled a woman near Paddington. Sex maniac, I suppose. It doesn't say much, does it? Please say anxious interview man. Seen him in Cindy, of Culver Street at the time. Medium height, wearing darkish overcoat, lightest scarf, and soft felt hat. Police messages with the, to this effect been broadcast throughout the day. Useful description. Could fit pretty well anyone, couldn't it? When it says that the police are anxious to interview someone, is that a polite way in the saying that he or she is the murderer? Could be. Uh, who is this woman who was killed? Oh, Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Maureen Lyon. Young or old? It doesn't say. Doesn't seem to have been robbery. I told you, sex maniac. Oh, uh, this is Miss Casewell, Molly, my wife. How do you do? It's an awful night. Would you like to come up to your room? The water's hot if you'd like a bath. You're right, I would. Ha, 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 ha.
So, well, not not very original, perhaps. Do let me help. I am so cooking. Why not an omelet? You've got eggs, haven't you? Oh yes, we've got plenty of eggs. We keep lots of fowls. They don't lay as well as they should, but we put down a lot of eggs. And if you got a bottle of cheap, any type wine, you can add it to the uh, minced beef and cereal, did you say? Give it a continental flavor. Show me where the kitchen is and what you've got, and I dare say I shall have an inspiration. <laughs> Come on. Isn't he sweet? He's putting on an apron, and he's getting all the things together. He said, leave it all to him and don't come back for half an hour. I say, if the guests want to do the cooking themselves, it'll save us a lot of trouble. Why on earth did you give him the best room? I told you, he liked the four poster. Oh, he liked the pretty four poster. Twerp. Giles! I've got no use for that kind. You didn't handle his bag. I did. Had it got bricks in it? It had no weight at all. If you ask me, he's, well, he's probably one of those young men who go about bilking hotel keepers. I don't believe it. I like him. I think Miss Casel's rather peculiar, don't you? Terrible female. If she is a female... <laughs> it seems very hard that all our guests should either be unpleasant or odd. Anyway, I think Major Metcalf's all right, don't you? Oh, probably drinks. Oh, do you think so? No, no, I don't. I was just feeling rather depressed. Well, at any rate, we know the worst now. They've all arrived. Well, who can that be? Probably the Culver Street murderer. Don't. Oh, uh, a thousand pounds, I am. Where am I? Uh, this is Monkswell Manor Guest House. But what stupendous good fortune. Madam, what's an answer to prayer, a guest house and a charming hostess? Alas, my Rolls Royce has been stuck in a snow drift, blinding snow everywhere. I think to myself, I shall freeze to death. I do not know where I am. So I take a little bag, I stagger through the snow, I see before me big iron gates. A habitation I'm saved. I fall into the snow twice as I come up the drive, but at last I arrive, and immediately despair turns to joy. You can let me have a room, yes? Oh, yes. I'm afraid it's a rather small one, I'm afraid, but all the others are occupied. Naturally, naturally. You have other guests. Well, we've only just opened this place as a guest house today, so we're, we're rather new at it. Charming, charming. Uh, what about your luggage? That is of no consequence. I have locked the car securely. Yes, but wouldn't it be better to get it in? No, 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 no. I can assure you, on a night such as this, there will be no thieves abroad. And as for me, my wants are simple. I have all I need here in this little bag. Yes, all that I need. You'd better get thoroughly warm. I'll see about your room. I'm afraid it's a rather cold one because it faces the north, but all the others are occupied. You have several guests then? Well, there's Mrs. Boyle and Miss Casewell, and Major Metcalf, and a young man called Christopher Wren, and now you. Yes, the unexpected <laughs> guest. The guest that you did not invite. The guest that just arrived out of nowhere, out of the storm. It sounds quite dramatic, does it not? Me? Who am I? You do not know. Where do I come from? You do not know. Me? <laughs> I am the man of mystery. <laughs> but now I tell you this. I complete the picture. From now on, there will be no more arrivals and no more departures either. By tomorrow, perhaps even already, we are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman. No postman, no daily papers, nobody, nothing but ourselves. That is admirable. 
admirable. It could not suit me better. My name, by the way, is Peter the Singh. Oh, yes. Ours is Ralston. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. And this is Monkswell Manor Guest House, you say? <laughs> Monkswell Manor Guest House. <laughs> Perfect! <laughs> Perfect! <laughs> I consider it most dishonest not to tell me that they were even starting this place. Well, everything's got to have a beginning, you know. Excellent breakfast this morning, good coffee, scrambled eggs, homemade marmalade, and all nicely served, too. Little woman does it all herself. Amateurs, there should be a proper stuff. Excellent lunch, too. Corned beef. But very well disguised corned beef. Red wine in it. Miss Ralston's promised to make a pie for us tonight. These radiators are not really hot. I shall speak about it. Very comfortable beds, too. At least mine was. Hope yours was, too. It was quite adequate. I don't quite see why the best bedroom should have been given to that very peculiar young man. Got here ahead of us. First come, first served. From the advertisement, I got quite a different impression of what this place would be like. A comfortable riding room and a much larger place altogether. Right. With bridge and other amenities. Regular tabby's delight. I beg your pardon. Oh, I mean, yes, I, I quite see what you mean. No, indeed, I shan't stay here long. <laughs> no, no, I don't suppose you shall. <laughs> really, that is an incredible young man. Unbalanced mentally, I shouldn't wonder. Think he's escaped from a lunatic asylum. Well, I shouldn't be at all surprised. Giles. Yes? Can you shovel the snow away again from the back door? Coming. I'll give you a hand, what? Good exercise. Must have exercise. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So, it's... Really, what an incredible young woman. Doesn't she know anything about housework, carrying a carpet sweeper through the front hall? Aren't there any back stairs? Oh, yes, a nice back stairs. Very convenient if there was a fire. Then why not use them? Anyways, all the housework should have been done in the morning before <coughs> lunch. I gather our hostess had to cook for lunch. All very haphazard and amateurish. There should be a proper staff. Not very easy to get now. for days, is it? No, the lower classes seem to have no idea of their responsibilities. <sighs> Poor old lower classes. Got the bit between their teeth, haven't they? I gather you're a socialist. Oh, I'm not a red, just pale pink. <laughs> oh, but I don't take much interest in politics. I've lived most of my life abroad. Well, I suppose conditions are much easier abroad. I don't have to cook and clean, as I gather most people have to do in this country. This country has gone sadly downhill, not what it used to be. I sold my house last year. Everything was too difficult. Hotels and guest houses are easier. Well, they certainly solved some of one's problems. Are you over in England for long? Depends. I've got some business to see to. Well, when it's done, I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. I know, but it's much more than you 
jug, chill blains, raw and bleeding, one thin, ragged blanket, a child shivering with cold and fear. My dear, it sounds too, too grim. What is it, a novel? You didn't know I was a writer, did you? Are you? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Actually, I'm not. Yes. Yes, this is Monkswell Manor Guest House. What? No, I'm afraid Mr. Ralston can't come to the telephone just now. This is Mrs. Ralston speaking. Who? The Berkshire Police. Oh, yes, Superintendent Hogman. I'm afraid that's impossible. He'd never get here. We're snowed up. Yes, completely snowed up. The roads are impassable. Nothing's been able to get through. Yes. Very well. But what? Hello? Hello? Molly, do you know where there's another spade? Giles, the police have just rung up. Having trouble with the police, eh? Serving liquor without a license? Up to say they're sending out an inspector or sergeant or something. But but he'll never get here. That's what I told them, but they seemed quite confident that he would. Oh, nonsense. Even a jeep couldn't get through today. Anyways, what's it all about? I wanted to say, just that I was to impress on my husband to listen very carefully to what Sergeant Trotter, I think it was, and to follow his instructions implicitly. Isn't it extraordinary? What on earth do you think we've done? Do you think it's those nylons from Gibraltar? I did remember to get the wireless license, didn't I? Yes, it's in the kitchen dresser. I, I had a rather near shave with the car the other day, uh, but it was entirely the other fellow's fault. Oh, well, we must have done something. Oh, probably something to do with running this place. I expect we've ignored some uh, tin pot regulation of some ministry or other. Practically can't avoid it nowadays. Oh dear, I wish we'd never started this place. We're going to be snowed up for days, and everyone is cross, and we shall go through all the reserve tins. Oh, cheer up, darling. Everything's going all right at the moment. I, I filled up all the coal scuttles, and, and brought in the wood, and stoked the agar, and done the hens. I'll go do the boiler next, and chop some kindling. You know, Molly, come to think of it, it, it must be something pretty serious to send a police sergeant trekking out in all of this. It must be something really urgent. Ah, there you are, Mr. Ralston. Do you know that the central heating in the library is practically stone cold? Sorry, Mrs. Boyle. We're a bit short on coke. I'm not paying seven guineas a week here. Seven guineas and I do not want to freeze. I'll go and stoke it up. Mrs. Ralston, if you don't mind my saying so, that is a very extraordinary young man you have staying here. His manners and his ties. And does he ever brush his hair? He's an extremely brilliant young architect. I beg your pardon. Christopher Wren is an architect. My dear young woman, I had naturally heard of Sir Christopher Wren. Of course he was an architect. He built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think that no one is educated but yourself. I meant this Wren. His name is Christopher. His parents called him that because they'd hoped he'd be an architect one day. And he is one, or nearly one. So it turned out all right. <laughs> Sounds a fishy story to me. I should make some inquiries about him if I were you. 
What do you know of him? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle, which is you post a pain at seven guineas a week. That is really all I need to know, isn't it? And all that concerns me? It doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests or whether I don't. You are young and inexperienced and should offer advice from someone more knowledgeable than yourself. And what about this foreigner? Or what about him? You weren't expecting him, were you? To turn away a bona fide traveler is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You should know that. Why do you say that? Weren't you a magistrate sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle? Well, all I say is that this power of a senior, whatever he calls himself, seems to me. Beware, dear lady. You speak of the devil, and here he is. Ha ha! Oh, I didn't hear you come in. I came in on tiptoe like this. People do not hear me if I do not want them to. I find it very amusing. Indeed. Now, there was the young lady. Well, uh, I better get on with my letters. I'll see if it's a bit warmer in the drawing room. What is it, my dear lady? My charming hostess looks upset. I'm afraid everything's rather difficult this morning because of the snow. Yes, the snow can make things difficult, or else it could make them easy. Yes, very easy. I don't know what you mean. No, there is quite a lot you do not know. For one, I think you do not know much about the running a guest house. I dare say we don't, but we need to make a go of it. Bravo, bravo. I'm not such a very bad cook. You are, without a doubt, an enchanting cook. <laughs> May I give you a word of warning, Mrs. Ralston? You and your husband must not be so trusting, you know. Have you references with these guests of yours? Is that usual? I always thought people just, just came. It is advisable to know a little about the people who sleep under your roof. Take, for example, myself. I turn up saying that my car is over in the snow today. What do you know of me? Nothing at all. I may be a thief, a robber, a fugitive from justice, a madman, even, even a murderer. Oh. And you see, perhaps you know just as little of your other guests as well. Well, as far as Mrs. Boyle goes, oh, that drawing room is far too cold to sit in. I shall write my letters in here. Allow me to poke the fire for you. Your husband about, I'm afraid the pipes of the, uh, the downstairs cloakroom are frozen. Oh, oh dear, what an awful day. First the police, and then the pipes. Police, did you say? <laughs> they rang up just now to say they're sending out the sergeant. But I don't think he's ever going to get here. The running coach more than half to go. And the fries. Hello, is anything the matter? I hear the police are on their way here. Why? Oh, that's all right. No one will get through in this. The drifts must be five feet deep. Oh, the roads are all banked up. Nobody will get through today. Excuse me, Mr. Patterson, may I put these down? Oh! Are you Mr. Ralston? Yes. Thank you, sir. Detective Sergeant Trotter, Berkshire Police. Can I get off these skis and stir them somewhere? Yes. <laughs> Go around that way to the front door. I'll meet you. Thank you, sir. Well, I suppose that's what we pay our police sports for nowadays. To go around and join themselves at winter sports. Why did you send for the police, Mrs. Ralston? But I didn't. Who's that man? Where did he come from? He passed through the drawing room window on skis, all over snow, but looking terribly hearty. <laughs> Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Trotter. Good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant, you're too young. I'm not quite as young as I look, madam. But terribly hearty. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll stow your skis away under the stairs. Excuse me, Miss Ralston, but may I use your telephone? Of course, Major Metcalf. He's very attractive, don't you think so? I think police are not very attractive. <laughs> no brains. Out at a glance. Hello? Hello? Miss Ralston, this telephone is dead. Quite dead. It was all right about half an hour ago. The lights are off the way the snow, I suppose. <laughs> That's so cut off then. Quite cut off. That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I 
don't see anything to laugh at. No, indeed. Uh, it, it, it's a private joke of my own. Now we can get down to business, Mr. Rolston. Mrs. Rolston, uh, do you want to see us alone? If so, we can go into the library. It isn't necessary, sir. It'll save time if everyone's present. If I might sit at this desk. Oh, do hurry up and tell us, Sergeant. What have we done? Done? Oh, it's nothing of that kind, Mrs. Rolston. It's something quite different. It's more a matter of uh, police protection, if you understand me. Police protection? Yes. It relates to the death of Mrs. Lyle. Mrs. Maureen Lyon, 24 Culver Street, London, West 2, who was murdered yesterday, the 15th instant. You may have heard or read about the case. Yes, I heard it on the wireless. The woman who was strangled? That's right. Now, I'd like, the first thing I'd like to know is if you were in any way acquainted with Mrs. Lyon. Never heard of her. You may have known her under the name of Lyon. It wasn't her real name. She had a police record and her fingerprints were on file. So we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her real name was Maureen Stanning. Her husband was a farmer, John Stanning, who resided at Longridge Farm, not very far from here. Uh, Longridge Farm? Well, isn't that where those children Yes, were? the Longridge Farm case. Three children. That's right, miss. A Corrigan's. Two boys and a girl, brought before the court as in need of care and protection. Her home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died as a result of criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. It was horrible. The Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison. Mrs. Stanning served her sentence and was duly released. Yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled at 24 Colwood Street. Who did it? I'm coming to that, madam. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. In that notebook screen was written two addresses. One was 24 Colwood Street. The other was Monkswell Manor. What? Yes, sir. That's why Superintendent Oliver, upon receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it imperative for me to come out here and see if you knew of any connection between this house, or anyone in this house, and the Longridge Farm case. Oh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. It must be a coincidence. Superintendent Oliver doesn't think it's a coincidence, sir. He'd have come here himself if it had been in any way possible. But under the weather conditions, and as I can ski, he sent me with instructions to get full particulars of everyone inside the house to report back in by phone and to take what measures I saw fit to ensure the safety of the household. <coughs> safety? What danger does he think we're in? Good Lord, Shilling's not suggesting somebody's going to be killed here. I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, oh. frankly. Yes, that's the idea. Well, but why? <laughs> that's what I've got to find out from you. No, the whole thing's crazy. Yes, sir. It's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Nonsense. I must say, it seems a bit far-fetched. Well, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Is there something you haven't told us, Sergeant? Yes, Mrs. Rolston. Below the two addresses was written three blind mice. And on the dead woman's body was a paper with this is the first written on it. And below the words was a drawing of three mice and a bar of music. The music was the tune to the nursery rhyme, three blind mice. Well, you all know how it goes. Three blind mice. Three, three blind mice. See how they run. They all run after the farmer's wife. Oh, it's horrible. There were three children and one died? Yes, the youngest, a boy of 11. Well, what happened to the other two? The girl was adopted by someone, but we haven't been able to trace her present whereabouts. The elder boy would now be about, oh, uh, 22, deserted from the army and hasn't been heard of since. According to the army psychologist, was definitely schizophrenic. Uh, a bit queer in the air, that's to say. And they think that it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, I mean, Mrs. Stanning? Yes. And that he's going to turn up here and try to kill someone? But why? That's what I've got to find out from you. As a superintendent, there must be some connection. Now, you state, sir, that you yourself have never had any connection with this long farm business? No. And the same goes for you, madam? I... I mean, no connection. Hmm. What about servants? Whew. We haven't got any servants. That reminds me, Sergeant Trotter. Would you mind if I go to the kitchen? I'll be there if you need me. It's quite all right, Mrs. Rolston. Now, can I have all your names, please? This is ridiculous. We are merely staying in a crime hotel. We've only arrived yesterday. We've nothing to do with this place. But you plan to come here in advance. You booked your rooms here ahead. Well, yes, all except Mr. Barbicini. My car over town being a snow belief. I see. What I'm getting at is that anyone who's been following you around might know very well that you were planning on coming here. Now, there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quick. Which one of you is it that has some connection with this business at Longridge Farm? You're not being very sensible, you know. One of you is in danger, deadly danger, and I've got to know which one that is. <laughs> All right, I'll ask you one by one. 
You first. Since you seem to have arrived here more or less by accident, Mr. Perry. Ah, Barbecy. But my dear inspector, I know nothing but nothing of what you've been talking about. I am a stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. <laughs> Mrs. Boyle. I don't see. Really, I consider it an impertinence. Why on earth should I have anything to do with distressing business? All right. Miss. Casewell. Leslie Casewell. I never heard of Longridge Farm, and I know nothing about it. <laughs> you, sir. Metcalf, Major. I read about the case of the papers at the time. I was stationed in Edinburgh then. No personal knowledge. All right. And you? Oh, Christopher Wren. I was a mere child at the time. I don't remember even hearing about it. <laughs> and that's all you have to say. Any of you? Well, if one of you gets killed, you'll have yourself to blame. Now then, Mr. Rolston, can we have a look around the house? My dears, how melodramatic. He's very attractive, isn't he? <laughs> I admire the policeman. Always so stern and hard-boiled. Quite the thrill, this whole business. Now, three blind mice. How does that team go? Really, Mr. Wren? Oh, don't you like it? But the signature, too. The signature of the murderer. Oh, it's just fancy when it came to us to get any out of it. <laughs> Melodramatic rubbish. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, but just wait, Mrs. Boyle. Till I creep up behind you and you feel my hands on your throat. That'll do, Christopher. It's a poor joke anyway. In fact, it's not a joke at all. Oh, but it is. That's just what it is. It's a madman's joke. That's what makes it so deliciously macabre. Hopefully, I can see all the looks and all of your faces. <laughs> oh. oh, a singularly ill man in your rotten man. Oh, where's Giles? Taking our policeman on the conductor toward the house. Your friends, the architects, has been behaving in a most abnormal manner. The young fellow seems nervy nowadays. Dare say no grounds of it. Nerves? I have no patience for people who say they have nerves. I happen to be nerves. No? Perhaps that's just as well for you, Mrs. Boyle. What do you mean? I think you were actually magistrate on the bench at the time. In fact, you were responsible for sending those three <coughs> children to Longridge Farm. Really, Major Metcalf, I can hardly be held responsible. We had reports from welfare workers. The farm people were very nice and seemed most anxious to have the children. It seemed most satisfactory, eggs and fresh milk and a healthy out the doors life. Kicks, blows, starvation, and a thoroughly vicious couple. How was I to know? They were very civilly spoken. Yes, I was right. It was you. One tries to do a public duty and all one gets is abuse. <laughs> You must excuse me, but indeed I find all this most amusing. <laughs> I enjoy myself greatly. <laughs> really, that is an incredible young man. Where did he come from last night? I don't know. Looks a bit of a spit to me. Makes his face up too. Disgusting. Rouge and powder. He must be quite old, too. And yet he skips about as though he were quite young. He'll be wanting more wood. I'll get it. It's almost dark. And yet it's only four. I'll turn the light on. That's better. Now, where did I leave my pen? Horrid little tune that is. And don't you like it? Reminds you of your childhood. Perhaps an unhappy childhood. I was very happy as a child. You were lucky. Weren't you happy? <laughs> no. I'm sorry. But all that's a long time ago. And one gets over things. Perhaps. Or doesn't one? Damn hard to say. They say that what happens when your child matters more than anything else. They say, they say. Who says? Psychologist. All humbug, just a damn lot of nonsense. I've no use for psychologists and psychiatrists. I've never really had much to do with them. It's a good thing for you, you haven't. It's all lots of hooey, the whole thing. Life's what you make of it. Go straight ahead, don't look back. One can't always help looking back. Nonsense, it's a question of willpower. I suppose so. I know. 
I expect you're right, but sometimes things happen to make you remember. Um, don't give in. Turn your back on them. Is that really the right way? I wonder. Perhaps one really ought to face them. Depends what you're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes I hardly know what I'm talking about. Nothing from the past is going to affect me, except in the way I want to do. Well, everything's all right upstairs. Sorry, madam, but I've got to get a lay of the land. Now, Molly, what's this all about? This, well, that completes the tour. Nothing suspicious. I think I'll make my report to Superintendent Ogden now. Oh, but you can't telephone. The line's dead. What? Since when? Major Metcalf tried it just after you arrived. But it was all right earlier. Superintendent Ogden got through all right. I expect since then the lines are down with the snow. Hmm. I wonder. It may have been cut. Cut? But who could cut it, Mr. Ralston? Just how much do you know about these people who are staying in your guest house? I... We... We don't really know anything about them. Ah. Mrs. Boyle wrote from a Bournemouth hotel. Major Metcalf from an address... Uh, where was it? Leamington. Uh, Wren wrote from Hampstead. And the case were a woman from a private hotel in Kensington. Uh, Paravicini, as we've told you, showed up out of the blue last night. Still, I suppose they've all got ration books, that sort of thing. I shall go into all that, of course. But there's not much reliance to be placed in that sort of evidence. Uh, but even if this, this crazy killer is trying to get here and kill us all, or one of us, we're quite safe now, because of the snow. No one could get here until it melts. Unless he's here already. Here already? Why not, Mr. Ralston? All these people arrived here yesterday, some hours after the murder of Mrs. Stanning. Plenty of time to get here. But except for Mr. Peravicini, they'd all booked beforehand. Why not? His crimes were planned. Crimes? There's only been one crime. In Culver Street. Why are you so sure there will be another here? That it will happen here? No. I hope to prevent that. No, I and can't believe it. It's so fantastic. It's not fantastic. It's just facts. You have a description of what this, this man looked like in London? Medium height. Indeterminate build. Darkish overcoat. Lightish felt hat. Face hidden by a muffler and he spoke in a whisper. There are three darkish overcoats hanging up in the hall right now. One of them is yours, Mr. Ralston. There are three lightish felt hats. I can't believe it. You see? It's this telephone wire that worries me. If it's been cut... I must go and get on with the vegetables. Is there an extension? I beg your pardon, did you say something? Yes, Mr. Rawson, I said, is there an extension? Yes, up in our bedroom. Well, go and try it up there for me, will you? Stand what I may term as the mechanics of fear, you have to study the precise effect produced on the human mind. Imagine, for instance, that you are alone in a room. It is late in the afternoon. A door opens softly behind you. A man oh, appears. It's you. I can't find the any open program door. I'm listening to. You. Here? What are you doing? Why did you turn out the light?
think my head's numb. Mrs. Boyle had only just been killed when you got to her. Are you sure you didn't see or hear anyone as you came along the hallway? No, no, I don't think so. Just the radio blaring out in here. I couldn't think who turned it on so loud. I wouldn't hear anything else with that, would I? That was clearly the murderer's idea. Or murderess. How could I hear anything else? You might have done. If the murderer had left the hall that way, he might have been coming from the kitchen, slipped up the back stairs, or the dining room. I think. I'm not sure. I heard a door creak and shut just as I came out of the kitchen. Which door? I don't know. Think, Mrs. Ralston. Try and think. Upstairs, downstairs, close at hand, right, left. I don't know, I tell you. I'm not even sure I heard anything. Oh, can't you stop, Pauline? Huh? Uh, can't you see she's all in? We're investigating a murder, Mr. Ralston. Up to now, nobody's taken this thing seriously. Mrs. Boyle didn't. She held out on me with information. In fact, you all held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. And unless we get down to the bottom of this, and quickly mine, there's going to be another death. Another nonsense. Why? Because there were three little blind mice. A death for each of them. Uh, but there would have to be some connection. I mean, another connection with the Longridge farm business. Yes, there would have to be that. Uh, but why another death here? Because there were only two addresses in the notebook we found. Now, at 24 Culver Street, there was only one possible victim. She's dead. But here at Monkswall Manor, there's a wider field. Nonsense! Surely it would be a most unlikely coincidence that there should be two people brought here by chance, both of them with a share in the Longridge Farm case. Given certain circumstances, it wouldn't be too much of a coincidence. Think it out, Miss Casewell. Now, I want to get down quite clearly where everyone was when Mrs. Boyle was killed. I've already got Mrs. Ralston's statement. You were in the kitchen preparing vegetables. You came out of the kitchen, through the passage, along the hall, and in here. The lights were turned off, the hall was dark, and the radio was blaring. You switched the lights on, saw Mrs. Boyle, and screamed. Yes, I screamed and screamed, and at last people came. Yes, as you say, people came. A lot of people from different directions, all arriving more or less at once. Now, when I went out that door, you, Mr. Ralston, went up to the room that you and Mrs. Ralston occupied. You tried the extension telephone? Where were you when Mrs. Ralston screamed? Well, I was still up in our bedroom. The extension telephone was dead, too. I looked out the window to see if I could see any signs of the wires being cut there, but I couldn't. Just after I closed the window again, I heard Molly scream and I rushed down. Those simple actions took you a rather long time, didn't they, Mr. Ralston? Well, I don't think so. I should say you definitely took your time over them. I was thinking about something. Now, Mr. Red, what about you? I went into the kitchen to see if there's anything I could do to help Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. I had door cooking. After that, I went upstairs to my bedroom. Why? It's, it's quite a natural thing to go to one's bedroom, don't you think? I mean, one does want to be alone sometimes. You went to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. I wanted to, to, to brush my hair and tidy up. You wanted to brush your hair? Anyway, that's where I was. And you were at Mrs. Ralston's screen. Yes. And you came down? Yes. Curious that you and Mr. Ralston didn't meet on the stairs. I came down by the back stairs and near to my room. Did you go up to your room by the back stairs or did you come through here? I came up by the back stairs too. All right. I have told you. I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Through that, Inspector. I'm not an inspector, just a sergeant, Mr. Paravicini. Did anyone hear you playing the piano? I do not expect so. I was playing very softly with one finger. You were playing three blind mice. Is that so? It is, how shall I say, a haunting little tune, don't you all agree? I think it's horrible. And yet it runs in people's heads. Somebody was whistling it, too. Whistling it? Where? I do not know. Perhaps in the hall. Perhaps on the stairs. Perhaps upstairs in the bedroom. <coughs> Who was whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Paradisini? No, Inspector. I beg your pardon, Sergeant. I would not do a thing like that. Well, go on. You were playing the piano in the drawing room? With one finger, so. And then I hear the rain. It, it was playing very loud. It offended my ear. Somebody was shouting on it. Then after that, all of a sudden, I hear Mrs. Ralston scream. Mr. Ralston upstairs, Mr. Wren upstairs, Mr. Paris City in the drawing room. Miss Casewell? I was writing letters in the library. Could you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Mrs. Ralston screamed. And what did you do then? I came in here. At once? I believe so. You say you were writing letters when you heard Mrs. Ralston scream? Yes. You got up from the writing desk earlier, then you came in here? Yes. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any unfinished letter on the writing desk in the library. I brought it with me. Hmm. 
dearest Jessie, a friend of yours or a relation? That's none of your damn business. Perhaps not. You know, if I have to hear someone screaming blue murder while I was writing a letter, I don't think I'd take my time to pick up the unfinished letter, fold it, and put it in my handbag before going to see what was the matter. You wouldn't? How interesting. Now, what about you, Major Metcalf? You were in the cellar. Why? Looking around, just looking around, I, I looked into the cupboard place under the stairs near the kitchen. A lot of junk and sports tackle. I noticed there was another door inside it. I opened it and saw a flight of steps. I was curious and I went on down. Nice cellars you've got. I'm glad you like them. Not at all. Crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why this place is called Munchworth. We're not engaged in antiquarian research, Major Metcalf. We are investigating murder. Now, Mrs. Ralston has told us that she heard a door shut with a faint creak. That particular door shut with a creak. It could be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Ralston coming from the kitchen. He jumped into the cupboard, pulling the door after him. A lot of things could be. But there would be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Mine are there, all right, but most criminals are careful to wear gloves, aren't they? It's usual. But all criminals slip up sooner or later. I wonder, Sergeant, if that's really true. But look here, aren't we wasting time? There's one person... Please, that... Mr. Rolston, I am in charge of this investigation. Oh, very well, but... Mr. Rolston! <laughs> Thank you. Now, we've got to establish opportunity, you know, as well as motive. And let me tell you this, you've all had opportunity. Let me explain. There are two staircases. Anyone can go up by one and come down by the other. Anyone can go down to the cellar by the cupboard in the kitchen door and come up by the flight of steps that leads to the trap door at the base of the stairs right here. Now, the vital fact is that every one of you was alone at the time the murder was committed. But look here, Sergeant, you speak as though we were all under suspicion. Well, that's absurd. In a murder case, everyone is under suspicion. Oh, but you know pretty well who killed that woman in Culver Street. You think it's the eldest of those three children at the farm. A mentally abnormal young man who is now 23 years of age. Well, damn it all, there's only one person here who fits that bill. Oh, it's not true. It's not true. You're all against me. It was always been against me. You're going to frame me for murder. Well, that's persecution. That's what it is. Persecution! Steady, lad. Steady. It's all right, Chris. Nobody's against you. Tell him it's all right. We don't frame people. Tell him you're not going to arrest him. I'm not arresting anyone yet. To do that, I'd have to have evidence. I haven't got any evidence yet. I think you're crazy, Molly. And you too. There's just one person who fits the bill, and if only as a safety measure, he ought to be put under arrest. It's only fair to the rest of us. Wait, Giles. Wait. Sergeant Trotter, can I... Can I speak to you a minute? Certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Will the rest of you go into the dining room, please? Well, I'm staying. No, Giles, you too, please. I'm staying. I don't know what's come over you, Molly. Please. Yes, Mrs. Walton. What do you want to say to me? Sergeant Charter, you think that this, this crazy killer must be the eldest of those three boys at the farm, but you don't know that, do you? Actually, we don't know a thing. All we've got so far is that the woman who joined with her husband in the ill-treating and starvation of those children has been killed. The woman magistrate responsible for putting them there in the first place has been killed. The telephone that links me to police headquarters has been cut. But and then you don't even know that. It just may have been the snow. No, Mrs. Rolston. The line was deliberately cut. It was cut just outside your front door. I found the place. I see. Sit down, Mrs. Rolston. I'm going by probability. It all points in the same direction. Mental instability, childish mentality, desertion from the army, and the psychiatrist's report. Oh, I know, and therefore it all seems to point to Christopher. But I don't believe it is Christopher. There must be other possibilities. Such as? Well, how did those children any relations at all? The mother was a drunk. She died soon after the children were taken away from her. And what about the father? He was an army sergeant, serving abroad. If he's alive, he's probably discharged from the army by now. You don't know where he is now? We've no information. To trace him would take time. But I can assure you, Mrs. Ralston, the police take every eventuality into account. But you don't know where he may be at this minute. And if the son is mentally unstable, then the father may be unstable as well. Well, it's a possibility. 
Well, if he came home after being a prisoner with the Japs, perhaps, and having suffered terribly, if he came home and found his wife dead, and that his children had gone through some terrible experience, and one of them had died through it, well, he might have gone off his head a bit and want revenge. That's just a mark. But it's possible. Oh, yes, Mrs. Rawson, it's quite possible. So the murderer may be middle-aged or even old. When I said the police had rung up, Major Metcalf was frightfully upset. He really was. I saw his face. Major Metcalf? Middle-aged, a soldier. He seems quite nice and perfectly normal. But it might not show, might it? No, often it doesn't show at all. So it's not only Christopher who's a suspect, there's Major Metcalf as well. Any other suggestions? Well, Mr. Paravacini did drop the phone when I said the police had rung up. <coughs> Mr. Paravacini. Oh, I know he seems quite old and foreign and everything, but he mightn't really be as old as he looks. He moves around like a much younger man, and he's definitely got makeup on his face. In case we'll notice it too. He might be, oh, I know it sounds very melodramatic, but he might be disguised. You're very anxious, aren't you, that it shouldn't be young Mr. Red. He seems so helpless somehow, and so unhappy. Let me tell you something, Mrs. Ralston. I've had all the possibilities in mind ever since the beginning. The boy, Georgie, the father, and someone else. There was a sister, do you remember? Oh, the sister? Yes. It might have been a woman who killed Maureen Lyon. A woman. The muffler pulled up, and the man's felt hat pulled well down, and the killer whispered, you know, Yes, it could have been a woman. Miss Casewell? Oh, she looked a bit old for the part. Yes, Mrs. Ralston, there's a very wide field. There's yourself, for instance. Me? You're about the right age. Oh, no, no, whatever you tell me about yourself, I've got no means of checking at the present moment, remember. And then there's your husband. Giles, how ridiculous. He and Christopher Wren are much of the same age. Say, your husband looks older than his years. <clears throat> Christopher Wren looks younger. Actually, age is very difficult to tell. How much do you know about your husband, Mrs. Rolston? How much do I know about Giles? Don't be silly. You've been married how long? Just a year. And you met him where? At a dance in London. We went in a party. Did you meet his people? He hasn't any people. They're all dead. They're all dead? Yes, but, oh, you make it sound all wrong. His father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. You're only telling me what he told you. Yes, but... You don't know it of your own knowledge. It's outrageous You'd that... be surprised, Mrs. Ralston, if you knew how many cases rather like yours we get. Especially since the war. Homes broken up and families dead. Fellow says he's been in the Air Force or just finished his army training. Parents killed. No relations. There aren't any backgrounds nowadays. And young people settle their own affairs. They just meet and marry. His parents and relatives who used to make the inquiries before they consented to an engagement. Well, that's all been done away with. Now, girl just marries a man. Sometimes she doesn't find out for a year or two that he's an absconding bait clerk, or an army deserter, or something equally undesirable. How long had you known Giles Ralston before you married him? Just three weeks. And you don't know anything about him? That's not true. Why, I know everything there is to know about Giles. The sort of person he is, and it's absolutely ridiculous to suggest that he's some crazy homicidal maniac. Why, Giles wasn't even in London yesterday when the murder took place. Where was he? Here? No, he went off across the country to get some wire netting for the chickens. Bring it back with him. No, it turned out to be the wrong kind. Only what? 30 miles from London, aren't you? And you've got an ABC. An hour by train, a little longer by car. I tell you, Giles wasn't in London. Just a minute, Mrs. Ralston. This your husband's coat? <laughs> yes. Evening news. Yesterday's. Sold on the London streets about 3.30 yesterday afternoon. I don't believe it. Don't you? Don't you? Bully! Oh, you startled me. Where is he? Where is he gone? Who? The sergeant. He went out that way. Well, if only I could get away, somehow, some way. Was well, anywhere I could hide, in the house. Hide? Yes, from him. Why? But darling, that was so frightening against me. Gonna say I can make these murders, particularly your husband. Never mind him. Listen, Chris, you can't go on running away from things all your life. Why do you say that? Well, it's true, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's quite true. You've got to grow up sometime, Chris. I wish I hadn't. Your name isn't really Christopher Wren, is it? No. And you're not really training to be an architect? No. Then why did you... Call myself Christopher Wren. 
Well, he'll just amuse me. And when I saw always oh, just a laugh at me, he called me a little Christopher Robin. Robin, Wren, an association of ideas. It was hell being at school. What's your real name? We didn't get into that. I ran away while it's doing army service. It's all so beastly. I hated it. <clears throat> yes, I'm just like the unknown murderer. I told you I was the one with the specification fitted. You see, my mother, my mother. Yes, your mother. If only she hadn't died, she would have taken care of me and looked after me. You can't go on being looked after all your life. Things happen to you, and you've got to bear them, and you've got to go on just as usual. One can't do that. Yes, one can. You mean, you have? Yes. What was it, something very bad? Something I've never forgotten. Was it to do with Giles? No, it was long before I met Giles. I see. You must have been very young, only a child. Perhaps that's why it was so awful. It was horrible. It was horrible. I try to put it out of my mind. I try never to think about it. So, you're running away too. Running away from things instead of facing them. Yes, perhaps in a way I am. Considering that I never saw you until yesterday, we seem to know each other rather well. Yes, it's odd, isn't it? I guess there's a sort of sympathy between us. Anyway, you think I ought to stick it out. Well, frankly, what else can you do? I might pinch a salt and ski, so I can ski quite well. <laughs> that would be frightfully stupid. It would almost be like admitting you're guilty. Sergeant Trotter thinks I'm guilty. No, he doesn't. At least, I don't know what he thinks. I hate him. Who? Sergeant Trotter. He puts things in your head. Things that are true. Things that can't possibly be true. What is all this? I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What won't you believe? Come on, out of it. You see that? Yes. What is it? Yesterday's evening paper. A London paper. But Giles wasn't in London yesterday. Well, he's here all day. He went off in the car to get some wire and for the chicken, but he couldn't find any. Paul did go to London after all. Then why shouldn't he tell me he did? Why pretend he'd been racing all around the countryside? Perhaps with the news of this murder. But Giles didn't even know about the murder yesterday. Or oh, did he? Did he? Good Lord, Molly. Surely you don't think. The, the sergeant doesn't think. I don't know what the sergeant thinks. And he can make you think things about people. You ask yourself questions, and you begin to doubt. You feel that somebody you love, <laughs> and know well, might be a stranger. <laughs> That's what happens in a nightmare. You're in the middle of friends, and suddenly you look up at their faces, and they're not your friends any longer. They're different people. Different people just pretending. Perhaps you can't trust anybody. Perhaps everybody's a stranger. I seem to be interrupting something. No, we were just talking. I must go. There's the pie and the potatoes. I'll go eat to pieces. I'll come and give you a hand. No, you won't. Giles. Tete a are not very healthy things at present. You keep away out of the kitchen and keep away from my wife. Oh, really? Look you here. keep away from my wife, friend. She's not going to be the next victim. So that's what you think about me. Well, I've already said so, haven't I? There's a killer loose in this house, and it seems to me you fit this the bill. I'm not the only one to fit the bill. No, I don't see who else does. How blind you are, or do you just pretend to be blind? I tell you, I'm worrying about my wife's safety. So am I. I'm not going to leave you here alone with her. What the hell are you talking please about? Please go, I, Chris. I'm not going. Please go, Christopher, please. I mean it. Don't be far away. Oh, Molly, what is all this? You must be crazy. Perfectly prepared to shut yourself up in the kitchen with a homicidal maniac. He isn't. You've only got to look at him to see he's balmy. He isn't. He's just unhappy. I tell you, Giles, he isn't dangerous. I know if he were dangerous. And anyway, I can look after myself. That's what Mrs. Boyle said. Oh, Giles, don't. Look here, what is there between you and that wretched boy? What do you mean by between us? I'm sorry for him, that's all. Perhaps you've met him before. Uh, perhaps you suggested to him to come here and that you'd both pretend to meet for the first time. All cooked up between you, was it? Have you gone out of your mind? How dare you suggest these well, things? Rather odd, isn't it, that he should come and stay in an out-of-the-way place like this? No odder than that Miss K. Swallow so Major Metcalf and Mrs. Boyle should. I read once in a paper that these homicidal cases were able to attract women. Looks as though it were true. Where did you first know him? How long has this been going on? You know perfectly well that I never saw eyes of Christopher Wren until he arrived yesterday. That's what you say. 
Perhaps you've been running up to London to meet him on the slide. You know perfectly well that I haven't been up to London for weeks. Oh, you haven't been up to London for weeks. Is that so? <clears throat> well, is it? Then what's this? This is one of the gloves we were wearing yesterday. You dropped it. I picked it up this afternoon when I was talking to Sergeant Trotter. Do you see what's inside it? A London bus ticket. Oh, that. So it would appear that you didn't only go to the village yesterday. You went to London as well. All right, I was Whilst I was safely away racing around the countryside. Whilst you're racing around no, the countryside. come on now, admit it. You went to London. All right, I went to London. So did you. What? So did you. You brought back the evening paper. And where did you get a hold of that? It was in your overcoat pocket. Anyone could have put it in there. Did they? No, you were in London. All right, yes, I was in London, but I didn't get to meet a woman there. Didn't you? Are you sure you didn't? What do you mean? Go away, don't come near me. What's the matter? Don't touch me! Did you go to London yesterday to meet Christopher Wren? Don't be a fool, of course I didn't. Then why did you go? I shan't tell you that. Perhaps now I've forgotten why I went. Hey, Molly, what's come over you? You're different all of a sudden. I feel as though I don't know you anymore. Perhaps you never did know me. We've been married how long? A year? We really don't know anything about me. What I've done, or thought, or felt, or suffered before you knew me. Molly, you're crazy! All right then, I'm crazy. Why not? Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. Now, what the hell are you talking about? Now, it now, I do hope you both are saying a little more than you mean. One is so apt to in these lovers' quarrels. Lovers' quarrels? That's good. Quite so, quite so. I've been through all this myself when I was a younger man. Jeunesse. So jeunesse, as the poet says. Not been married long, I imagine. Now that's no business of yours, Mr. Paravicini. No, 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 no business at all. I just came in to say that the sergeant cannot find his keys. And I'm afraid he is getting very annoyed. Christopher. What's that? He is wondering, Mr. Austin, if you have by any chance moved them. No, of course not. Ah, there you are. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. Have you removed my skis from the cupboard back there where we put them? Oh, certainly not. Somebody's taken them. What made you happen to look for them? I need help here. Reinforcements. I was going to um, ski over to the police station at Market Hampton to report on the situation. And now you can't, dear, dear. Somebody seemed to, you certainly shan't do that. But there could be another reason, couldn't there? Yes, what? Somebody may want to get away. What did you mean when you said Christopher just now? Nothing. <laughs> so our young architect has hooked it, has he? Very, very interesting. Is this true, Mrs. Ralston? Oh, thank goodness, you haven't gone after all. Did you take my skis, Mr. Wren? Your skis, Sergeant? No, why should I? Well, Mrs. Ralston seemed uh, to Mr. think. Mr. Wren is very fond of skiing, and I thought he might have taken them out just to get a little exercise. Exactly. Now, listen, you people. This is a very serious matter. Someone has removed my only chance of communication with the outside world. I want everyone here, at once! I think Miss Casewell has gone upstairs. I'll get her. Left the Major Metcalf in the dining room. Major Metcalf. He's not there now. Oh, I'll try and find him. Hello? What's your name? The question of my skis. Skis? Mr. Austin. Have either of you two removed a pair of skis from the cupboard to the kitchen door? Good Lord, no! Why should I? And I didn't touch them. Nevertheless, they're gone. Which way did you go to your room? By the back stairs. Then you passed the cupboard door? If you say so. I have no idea where your skis are. You? You were actually in the cupboard today. Yes, I was. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed, I'd gone down to the cellar. With the skis in there when you passed through. I have the least idea. Did you see them there? That's right. Can't you remember if the skis were there then? No good shouting at me, young fellow. I wasn't thinking about any damn skis. I was interested in the cellars. Architecture, this place is very interesting. I opened the other door and I went on down. So I can't tell you whether the skis were there or not. You realize that you yourself had a very op excellent opportunity of taking them. Yes, yes, I grant you that, if I wanted to, that is. The question is, where are they now? Ought to be able to find them if we all set to. Not the case of Hunt the Thimble. Quacking great things. Skis. Supposing we all set to. Not so fast, Major Metcalf. But maybe, you know, what we were meant to do. Eh? I don't get you. I'm in the position where I've got to put myself in the place of a crazy cunning brain. I've got to ask myself what he wants us to do, and what he himself is planning on doing next. And I've got to keep just one step ahead of him, because if I don't, there's going to be another death. 
You still don't believe that? Yes, Miss Casewell, I do. Three blind mice. Two mice have been cancelled out. The third is yet to be dealt with. There are six of you here listening to me. One of you is the killer. One of you is the killer. I don't know which yet, but I shall. And another of you is the killer's prospective victim. That is the person I'm talking to. Mrs. Boyle held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. You, whoever you are, are holding out on me. Well, don't. Because anyone who's killed twice isn't going to hesitate to kill a third time. And as it is, I don't know which one of you it is who needs protection. Come on now! Any of you who has anything however slight to reproach themselves for this bygone business had best come out with it. All right. You won't. I'll get the killer. I have no doubt about that, but it may be too late for one of you. And I'll tell you another thing. The killer's enjoying this. Yes, he's enjoying himself a great deal. All right, you can go. Talking of chicken, dear lady, have you ever tried chicken's liver served on toast? that has been thickly smeared with foie gras, served with just a thin ration of bacon, and torched with just a soup on the mustard. I will come with you to the kitchen and see what we can cook together, a charming occupation. I'm helping my wife, Parvacini. Your husband is afraid for you. Quite natural under the circumstances. He does not fancy your being alone with me. It is my sadistic tendencies, he fears, not my dishonorable ones. Alas, what an inconvenience the husband always is. Arrivederla. I'm sure Giles doesn't think. He is very wise. Take no chances. Can I prove to you or to him that I am not a homicidal maniac? So difficult to prove negative. And suppose that instead I am real. Oh, don't. Such a gay little don't you think? She cut off their tails with a carving knife. Snick, snick, snick. Delicious, just with a child in the door. Cruel little things, children. Some of them never grow up. Uh, Stop frightening my wife at once, Pellevacini. It's silly of me, but you see, I found her. Her face was all purple. I can't forget it. Yes, it's difficult to forget. You aren't really the forgetting kind. I must go. There's the dinner and the food and the spinach all going to pieces. Please, Giles. <laughs> what do you think the lady did upset her, sir? Me, Sergeant? Oh, just a little innocent fun. I've always been fond of a little joke. It's nice fun, and it's fun that's not so nice. Now I do wonder what you mean by that, Sergeant. I've been doing a little wondering about you, sir. Indeed. And how that car of yours has returned the snow drip. So, conveniently? Inconveniently, don't you mean, Sergeant? That rather depends on the way you're looking at it. Just where were you bound for when you had this accident? Oh, I was on my way to see a friend. In this neighborhood? Not so very far from me. And what was the name and address of this friend? Now, really, Sergeant Crawford. Does that have anything to do now? I mean, it has nothing to do with this friend, has it? We always like to have the fullest information. What did you say your friend's name was? I didn't say. No, you didn't say. And it doesn't appear you're going to say. Now that's very interesting. But there might be so many reasons. An amour, this crashing, these jealous husbands. Rather old to be running about with a lady at your time of life, aren't you, Mr. Peregrine? My dear Sergeant Jarvis, I am not perhaps quite so old as I look. That's just what I've been thinking, sir. What? But you're not as old as you try to look. There's a lot of people going about trying to look younger than they are. If one goes about trying to look older, well, it does make one ask oneself why. Having asked so many questions of other people, you ask them of yourself as well. Isn't that overdoing things? I might get an answer for myself. I don't get many from you. Well, well, try again. That is, if you have any more questions to ask. One or two. Where were you coming from last night? That is simple, but I'm London. What address in London? I always stay at the Ritz Hotel. Very nice, too, I'm sure. What's your permanent address? I dislike permanency. Business or occupation? I play the market. Stockbroker? <laughs> no, you misunderstand me. Enjoy this, and sure of yourself, too. Well, 
I wouldn't be too sure, Mr. Perry, of proceeding. You're mixed up in a murder case, and don't you forget it. Murder isn't just fun and games. <laughs> Not even this murder. Dear me, Sergeant Crowder, you're very serious. I have always thought policemen are no sense of humor. Is the Inquisition over for the moment? For the moment, yes. Then I shall return to the drawing room to look for your skis, in case somebody has hidden them in the grand piano. Just a minute, please. <coughs> Wait, speak to me. Yes, perhaps we've come and have a seat. Well, what do you want? Oh, you may have heard some of the questions I was asking, Mr. Perry. I heard them. I'd like to have a little information of you. What do you want to know? Full name, please. Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell. Catherine? Yes, I spell it for the K. <laughs> Quite so. Address? Villa Mare Posa, Pine Hill, New York. Well, that's in Italy. It's an island, a Spanish island. And what's your address in England? Kerr Morgan's Bay, Leadenhall Street. And the other English addresses? No. How long have you been in England in this case, well? A week. And you've been staying since your arrival? At the Ledbury Hotel, Knightsbridge. What, what brought you to Monkswell Manor in this case, well? I wanted somewhere quiet, in the country. And how long did you, or do you propose to remain here? Until I have finished what I came here to do. And what was that? And what was that? Uh, what was it you came here to do? I beg your pardon, I was thinking. You still haven't answered my question, Miss Casewell. I really don't see, you know, why I should. It's a matter that concerns me alone, a strictly private affair. All the same, Miss Casewell. No, I don't think we'll argue about it. <clears throat> Would you mind telling me your age? Not in the least. It's on my passport. I'm 24. Twenty-four. You were thinking I look older. That is quite true. Is there anyone in this country who can vouch for you? My bank can reassure you as to my financial position. I can also, I can also refer you to a solicitor, a very discreet man. I'm not in any position to offer you a social reference. I have lived most of my life abroad. In Mallorca? In Mallorca and other places. Were you born abroad? Uh, no. I left England when I was thirteen. You know, I can't quite make you out, Miss Casewell. Does it matter? I don't know. What are you doing here? It seems to worry you. It does worry me. You said you left the country when you were 13? 12, 13, thereabouts. Was your name Casewell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It's a long time ago. I've forgotten. There are things one doesn't forget. Possibly. Unhappiness, despair. I dare say. What's your... Real name. I told you, Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell. Catherine, what the hell are you doing here? I. Oh God, I. I wish to God I'd never come here. I always thought the police were only deal with the third degree. I have merely been interrogating Miss Casewell. You seem to have upset her. What did he do? No. It's so horrible. It came over me suddenly. I'll go up to my room now. It's impossible. I can't believe it. What can't you believe? Six impossible things before breakfast, like the Red Queen? Oh, yes, Mr. Red. It's rather like that. Dear me, you look as though you've seen a ghost. I've seen something I ought to have seen before. Blind as a bat, I've been. But now, I think we may be able to get somewhere. So the police have a clue. Yes, Mr. Wren. At last, the police have a clue. I want everyone assembled here again. Do you know where they all are? Giles and Molly are in the kitchen. I've been helping Major Mick have look your skis. We've looked in the most entertaining of places. But I'll turn up the veil. I don't know where Kevin Cini is. I'll get him. You get the others. Mr. Pavacini. Mr. Pavacini! Yes, Sergeant? 
Can I help you? Little Bo policeman has lost his sneeze and doesn't know where to find him. Leave them alone and let's come home. Dragging a murderer behind them. What is all this? Sit down, Major. Mrs. Ralston. Well, must I come now? It's very inconvenient. There are more important things than meals, Mrs. Ralston. Mrs. Boyle, for instance, won't want another meal. That's a very tactless way of putting things, Sergeant. I'm sorry. But I want cooperation, and I intend to get it. Miss Ralston, will you go upstairs and ask Miss Casewell to come down? She went up to her room. Tell her it will only be for a few minutes. Have your skis been found, Sergeant? No, Mrs. Ralston. But I may say I have a very shrewd suspicion of who took them and why they were taken. I won't say any more at the present moment. Oh, please don't. I always think explanation should be kept to the very end. The exciting last chapter, you know. This isn't a game, sir. Well, isn't it? Now, though, I think you're wrong. I think it is a game. To somebody. You think the murderer is enjoying himself? Maybe. Maybe. Well, what is happening? Sit down, Miss Casewell. Mrs. Ralston. Now, you may remember that after the murder of Mrs. Boyle, I took statements from each of you. Those statements related to your position at the time the murder was committed. The statements were as follows. Mrs. Ralston cooking vegetables in the kitchen. Mr. Purvis C. playing the piano in the drawing room. Mr. Ralston upstairs. Mr. Wren, ditto. Miss Casewell in the library. And Major Metcalf in the cellar. Correct. Those were the statements you made. I had no means of checking those statements. They may be true, they may not. To put it quite clearly, five of those statements are true, but one is false. Which one? Five of you were speaking the truth, but one of you was lying. I have a plan which may help me discover the liar, and if I know that you who lied to me, then I know who the killer is. Not necessarily. Someone may have lied for some other reason. I rather doubt that. But I don't see the point. You just said you had no means of checking the statements. No. But supposing everyone would go through those actions a second time? Ah, that old chestnut reconstruction of the crime. That's a foreign idea. Not reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Parabasidi. Reconstruction of the movements of apparently innocent persons. And what do you expect to learn from that? You'll forgive me if I don't say at the present moment. You want a repeat performance? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I do. It's a trap. What do you mean, it's a trap? It's a trap, I know it is. I only want people to do exactly what they did before. But I don't see. I simply can't understand why you can hope to accomplish so making people do the exact same things you've done before. I think it's just nonsense. Do you, Mr. Wren? Well, you can count me out. I'm just I can't count anybody out. One might think from the looks of you that you're all guilty. Why are you so unwilling? Uh, of course what you say goes, Sergeant. We'll all cooperate. Eh, Molly? Very well. Wren? Miss Casewell? Yes. Pervasini? Oh, yes, I consent. Major Metcalf? Are we all to do exactly what we did before? The same actions we would before. Yes. Then I shall return to the piano in the drawing room and with one finger pick out the signature of the tune of the murderer. Not quite so fast, Mr. Paravicini. Do you play the piano, Mrs. Ralston? Yes, I do. And you know the tune between blind mice? Don't we all? Then you could pick it out on the piano with one finger, just as Mr. Paravicini did. Good. Go into the drawing room, sit at the piano, and be ready to play when I give you the signal. I thought we were each to repeat our former roles. The same actions will, will be performed, yes, but not necessarily by the same people. Thank you, Mrs. Ralston. I don't see the point. There is a point, Mr. Ralston. It's a means of checking up on the original statements, and maybe one statement in particular. Now, will you all listen up, please? I'll give each of you your new assignments. Mr. Wren, will you kindly go to the kitchen? Just keep an eye on Mrs. Ralston's dinner for her. You're very fond of cooking, I believe. Mr. Pervicini, go up to Mr. Wren's room by the back stairs is the most convenient way. Major Matka, go up to Mr. and Mrs. Ralston's room. Check the telephone wire there. Miss Casewell, will you go down to the cellars? Mr. Wren will show you the way. Unfortunately, I need someone to reproduce my own actions. Sorry to ask it of you, Mr. Ralston, but will you go out by that door and place the telephone wire round near the front? Rather a chilly job, but you're probably the toughest person here. And what are you going to do? I will be enacting the part of Mrs. Boyle. Taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? You'll all go to your stations and remain there until you hear me call you. Part of the games. No objection to wearing a coat. 
None at all, sir. I should advise it. Now, oh, take my torch behind the curtain. Mrs. Ralston, count to twenty and then begin to play. Mrs. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. Yes, I have exactly what I want. Do you know who the murderer is? Yes, I know. Which of them? You ought to know, Mrs. Ralston. I? Yes. You've been extraordinarily foolish, you know, by holding out information on me. You've had a very good chance of being killed. As a result, you've been in serious danger more than once. I don't understand. Oh, come on, Mrs. Ralston. We policemen aren't quite as dumb as we look. I knew all along you had first-hand knowledge of the Longridge Farm affair. You knew Mrs. Boyle was a magistrate concerned. In fact, you knew all about it. Why didn't you speak up and say so? I wanted to forget. Your maiden name was Waring? Yes. Ms. Waring. You taught at school. A school where those children went? Yes. It's true, isn't it, that Jimmy, the boy who died, managed to get a letter posted to you, asking for help <coughs> from his poor, kind, young school teacher. You never answered that letter. I couldn't. I never got it. No. You just didn't bother. That's not true. Why, I went down with pneumonia that very day, and the letter was put aside with others. And it was weeks afterwards that I found it was a lot of other important letters. And by then, that poor child was dead. He was dead. Waiting for me to do something, hoping, gradually losing hope. Oh, it's haunted me ever since. If only I hadn't been ill. If only I'd known. Oh, it's so monstrous that such things should happen. Yes, it's monstrous. I thought the police didn't carry revolvers. The policemen don't. I'm not a policeman, Mrs. Rolston. You thought I was a policeman because I rung up from a call box and said that I was Superintendent Ogden and that Sergeant Trotter was on his way. I cut the telephone wire before I got to the front door. You know who I am, Mrs. Rolston? I'm Georgie. I'm Jimmy's brother, Georgie. No, don't you scream, Mrs. Rolston, because if you do, I shall fire this revolver. And I want to talk to you a little. I said I wanted to talk to you a little. Jimmy died! That nasty two woman killed him! They put her in prison, but prison wasn't bad enough for her! I said I'd kill her one day. And I did, too. Oh, it was great fun in the fog. I hope Jimmy knows. I'll kill them all when I'm grown up. That's what I said to myself. Because grown ups can do anything they like. I'm going to kill you in a minute. You'd better not. You'll never get safely away. Oh, someone's taken my skis. I can't find them. But it doesn't matter. I don't care whether I get away or not. It's all been such fun watching you and pretending to be a policeman. That revolver will make a lot of noise. It will, rather. Better to do it the usual way and take you by the throat. The last little mouse in the trap. Georgie! You remember me, don't you? Don't you remember the farm, Georgie? The animal, that fat old pig, the day the bull chased us across the field? And the dogs. Dogs? Yes, spot and play. Cappy? Yes, Cappy. You remember me now, don't you? It is you, Cappy. What are you doing here? I came to England to find you. I didn't recognize you until you twirled your hair the way you always used to do. <laughs> yes, you always did it. Georgie, come with me. You're coming with me. Where are we going? It's all right, Georgie. I'm taking you somewhere where they will look after you and see that you won't do any more harm. Ralston! Ralston! Oh, Molly. Molly, you're all right, darling. Darling. Oh, who would have dreamt it was Trotter? He's mad, quite mad. Yes, but why were you in, 
I was mixed up in it all along. I taught in school those children went. I thought I could have done something to save that child. It wasn't my fault. Well, you should have told me. I wanted to forget it. Everything's under control. He'll be unconscious soon with the sad day. His sister's looking after him. Poor fellow's as bad as it happened. Both I have my suspicions of him all alone. You didn't believe he was a policeman? I knew he wasn't a policeman. You see, Miss Ralston, I'm a policeman. You? As soon as we got a hold of that notebook with Maxwell Dana written in it, we saw his vitals had something on the spot. When it was put to him, Major McMath agreed to let me take his place. I don't understand what Robinson done. And Casewell, is his sister? Yes, it seems she recognized him just before this last business. Didn't know what to do, but fortunately came to me about it just in time. Let's start the call. I hope she'll be here pretty soon. Oh, by the way, Miss Robinson, I'll, I'll remove those skis. Hit them on top of the floor first. Yes, I gathered they'll examine Pedovacini's car very carefully. I shouldn't be surprised if they found a thousand or so Swiss watches. And a spare wheel. Yes, that's his line of business. And that's a little bit of goods. Molly, I believe that you thought that I was mixed up in... Charles, what were you doing in London yesterday? Darling, I was buying you an anniversary present. We've been married just a year today. Oh, that's what I went to London for. I know you don't want you to know. No. They're cigars. I do hope they're all right. Oh, they're splendid. You will smoke them. I'll smoke them. Oh, what's my present? Oh, yes, I forgot all about your present. It's a hat. A hat? But I practically never wear one. Well, just for the best. Oh, darling, it's lovely. Put it on. Later, when my hair's done properly. <laughs> You're going to get some of the last thing you